I'll just tag everyone once again. Okay, great. So we'll start the lecture. So the first 20 to 30 minutes, I'll be taking any questions on the previous lecture. If there are no questions, great, we'll just move on. So first of all, this is lecture two. I'm supposed to start, talk about DNA packaging. But firstly, we'll talk about the different forms of DNA, which we discussed yesterday. Yesterday, we discussed the B form, the A form, and the Z form. So this is the A B form. This is the A form. This is the Z form. Z form. So this is a top-down view. So the DNA is actually rotating this way. And these blue-ish, these are the nitrogenous bases. And the black, yellow, red thingy, this is your sugar phosphate back, uh, backbone. So as you can see, the structure of the three types of DNA is quite distinct. Um, like a Can you all just mute your microphone? Okay, I'm muting the, the microphone. I'll just mute everyone's microphone right now. Yep, everyone is muted. So we'll continue. You have the right uh, the right handed B form, the right handed A form, and the left handed Z form. So the base pairs per turn. So what, what this talks about is if you remember yesterday, we were talking about minor grooves and major grooves. So a turn is basically one major groove to the other major groove or one minor groove to the other minor groove. So the, so if you notice the B form has 10 base pairs per turn, the A form has 11 and the Z form has 12. So that tells you that the Z form is the most condensed form of DNA. Hello there. Um, yes, hello. Do you have a question? Um, okay, if you have a question, please don't. Why is everyone muted? Because I'm the one lecturing and you can unmute your mic when you have a question. Great. So, so the Z form is the one which is actually the most condensed because it has 12 base pairs per turn. So the vertical rise per base pair what this is telling you, how much the structure is moving in a vertical direction per base pair added. So per base pair added, how much is it moving in a vertical? So this would be the Z axis, which is coming out of the screen. So, so the vertical rise per base pair would be 3.4 angstroms for B form, 2.56 angstroms for A form and 19 for Z form. So these numbers are practically useless. You don't need to remember these, but this tells you that the B form has quite a low, uh, low rise per base pair compared to Z form. So you see 19 and 3.4, that's quite a huge difference. And so this tells you the Z form is rotating very slowly. The B form rotates quite, quite quickly. And angstrom is basically a unit which is 10 raised to minus 10 meters. One angstrom is 10 raised to minus 10 meters. So that's just general knowledge. Then you have the rotation numbers and then you have the helical diameters. The helical diameters for all three are the same. So I've currently told you about only three forms of DNA. These three are the biologically active forms. Can anyone guess as to how many DNA forms you think exist in nature? I just type it into the chat if you have any idea. I'll just throw random numbers. Eight, okay, does anyone want to guess? 20, okay. 12, right, is anyone guessing? infinite zero uh hundred ah nice the actual so paris was the closest it's actually 21 forms of dna in nature and they've all been named a form b form c form d form e form so i think there are five letters left which are yet to be named after dna otherwise there are 21 forms of dna the these three which i am talking about b a and z these three are the biologically active forms the others are found in various other places such as say in uh, experiments where the conditions are not exactly the same as inside a cell. Now I told you in yesterday's lecture to read about what are the functions of these three forms of DNA. Does anyone have, like did anyone read through this? Any idea about the functions of A form and Z form? B form is the one we have. 
what is the function of a and z We'll just wait for them to finish typing and then we'll continue. A form helps to protect the DNA during desiccation of a cell. Yes, A form is the form which is found when the cell is dehydrated. So when bacterial cells get dehydrated, their DNA is form, found in the A form. A form, sorry, this is the A form. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Sometimes uh, it happens. You can have B DNA and Z DNA. In, in, a, in a sort of a junction found inside our cells right now. But the Z form is a very transient form and which is dissipated easily. It converts back to the B form quickly. So yeah, thanks for reading through. Now I'll ask if you have any questions on uh, the previous lecture. We'll just go through that before starting today's lecture. Okay, I don't think anyone has any questions. If you have any questions, please interrupt me. Anyway, we'll move on with today's lecture. So today's topics are DNA organization of the chromosomes and genomes. What are nucleosomes? What are, what are the types of chromatin? And we'll only talk about eukaryotic examples. We will not get into the prokaryotic example. Okay, someone has a question. Is the major group and minor group important? Yes, it's very important. I'll come to that in the packaging section. Yep, so we'll continue. DNA packaging. So I think you've heard of figures as to how long your DNA can be. It can be meters long. Your cell, if you extend out your DNA from each of your cells, it can be meters long. So how does it condense itself into a micrometer or nanometer scale? So it needs some sort of packaging system. And this, this is a very organized packaging system. It's not randomly mushing together things. It's quite organized. And there are certain rules uh, that have to be followed. So our DNA is packed in nice and like tight chromosomes. And these chromo chromosome numbers can vary with species. So us humans have 22 plus one sex pair. The other animals have other number of chromosomes which can differ. So this is actually uh, called the C-value paradox. I don't know how many of you have heard of the C-value paradox. The C-value is basically the amount of DNA present in a cell. So what, what, do you, what would you think would happen? Bacteria, which are very simple organisms, uh, single cell eukaryotes are very simple organisms. Much lesser amount of DNA compared to us. But that's not the case. Just because you have more, a more number of chromosomes does not mean you are more complex. That's the C-value paradox. Like logical sense would tell you that the more uh, the more DNA you have, the more complex the system would be. But that's not. So if you want, you can read more about the C-value paradox. But that's not very relevant to our lecture today. Okay. So there are certain levels of organization. There's a certain hierarchy in DNA packaging. The first one is you see a basic double helix of DNA. Then you have. Um, does anyone have a question? Should be, co co yeah, it's not, there, there is no correlation with complexity. Yep. So, so this is the DNA. Then you have a beads and a string model, which is formed, uh, which is called chromatin. So the yellow, yellow blobs, think of it like cheese, like cheese blocks. These are histones and histones form an octomer. An octomer is basically any protein which is formed out of eight separate pieces. The eight separate pieces form each histone molecule and these histones wrap around the DNA, like wrap the DNA around themselves. This is beads in a string. So basically that's what it is. So this is the string of DNA wrapped around the bead. It forms one three-fourth of a turn. So it does one and the second turn is not complete. It does three-fourth of a turn. That's not very relevant. It does one three-fourth of a turn. That's just some general knowledge. Then you have 30 nanometer chromatin fiber packed into the nucleosome. So these individual chromatin molecules are the beads and on a string. 
is wrapped around itself to compact it a bit more. So if you see, this was a two nanometer thick fiber, this is a 30 nanometer thick fiber. So the thickness is increasing and the length is decreasing. This, this, this is called a 30 nanometer chromatin fiber because of the width, 30 nanometers. And then, so once you have this 30 nanometer fiber, this 30, nan 30 nanometer fiber can form loops. And these loops are formed upon support protein. So these support proteins are found at the basement and they support these loops. So if you want, if you want to know more about support proteins, I suggest you Google this because we don't have time to cover support proteins right now. So this thickness is now around 300 nanometer, a 10 time increment. So finally, you have these uh, loops. These loops are condensed. And, the, and this condensed form, when arranged together, forms the regular chromosome, which is seen during mitosis. So a lot of you might have seen slides of mitosis happening. And this is what you find the chromosome around metaphase. So this is your entire mitotic chromosome, which is 1400 nanometers thick. It went from two nanometers to 1400 nanometers, a 700, uh, 700 time increment. How much is that? 700 times. It packs further and finally the condensed form, which is your chromosome. So 10,000 fold shorter than the extended length. If this length was say, 10,000 meters, that's just a random number, I just pick it off the head. This length would be about a meter. So 10,000 meters, which is about 10 kilometers, again, a random number, <laughs> don't quote me on this, 10 kilometers to one kilometer, about. So this is just a hypothetical calculation. So I'll be pausing for questions right now. Okay, yeah, chromosomes are condensed only during mitosis. Where in a regular cell, they are formed in a beads on a string structure or a 30 nanometer fiber. DNA is very rarely found in a, in a completely free state. It is found, I'm not saying it does, it's not, but it's quite rare. Any other questions? In prokaryotes, how is it organized? Uh, I will not get into prokaryote biology right now, but it's more or less the same. It's not very different, but there are significant differences. We'll talk about this in some other lecture. Okay, DNA packaging and nucleosome. So what are nucleosomes? A nucleosome is found on a bead in a string. So beads on a string and the beads on a string are basically histone molecules around which the DNA is wrapped. And this whole thing is called a nucleosome. The DNA histone complex is a nucleosome. And if you see closely, this is your 30 nanometer fiber. The nucleosomes wrapped around each other tightly. And this is a free beads on a string. So it is individual bead is a nucleosome, is a histone molecule around which DNA is wrapped. The connecting links between the Two histones is DNA. So this is an electromicrograph of your beads on a string. It's dynamic. Structure is very dynamic. So in epigenesis, so genetic control is basically you have expression of a gene or non-expression of a gene by mutation, deletion. So that's genetics. But epigenetics talks about stuff that is above genetics. So that's epigenetics, and that's controlled by how closely packed these nucleosomes are. So if you imagine, if the nucleosomes are very tightly wrapped around each other, proteins, your polymerases, your uh, other proteins required for transcription or trans transcription mostly, but once it's loose, it can even go uh, a lot more looser than this. Uh, if the distance between the nucleosome is increased, the DNA between them would be loose. And once this DNA is exposed, the transcription factors can come and start transcribing the DNA into a, a, a mRNA. So that's what happens. That's, that's the basics of epigenetic control. You control the distance between nucleosomes, you remove histones, you add more histones. There's a lot of epigenetics going on. If I'm like, if 
epigenetics is very interesting. During unwrapping, one can get chromatin remodeling complexes. What chromatin remodeling complexes uh, they do, what they do is they can increase or reduce the distances between histone molecules. So they can make the DNA more packed or less packed. If it's more packed, it will be expressed less. If it's less packed, if it's very loosely packed, it will be expressed more. So that's how you will further regulate the gene expression on an epigenetic level. I'll be pausing for questions now. So my audio keeps cutting out. Which part did it cut out on? So it might be, but it might screw up your screw up the recording around the epigenetics part. Okay, so what I was talking was epigenetics is basically uh, uh, another another type of regulation of gene expression, and that depends on your distance between two nucleosomes. If the distance between nucleosomes is greater, you will have a more transcription of the DNA. If the distance is lesser, you will have less transcription of the DNA. Yep, yep, methylation is also involved. Methylation can affect the packaging as well. Methylation can affect, ubiquitination can affect, acetylation can affect. There are so many types of methylation. And methylations can have two effects. Some methylations can activate gene expression. Some methylations can reduce gene expression. So it's quite a, quite a broad topic, which I cannot cover in one lecture. It'll take about... Not, not distance ultimately. Um, in a sense, you could say, because no matter what signals you have, what epigenetics marks you have, if the nucleosomes are tightly packed, there can be no transcription. But the epigenetic marks themselves control the distance. So it's kind of like a tug of war. Both of them are synergistically act to reduce or activate expression. Does anyone have any other questions? Or we can move on. Okay. No one has a question, we'll move on. So DNA packaging. So the nucleosome structure, what is the structure of the nucleosome? If you remember, I told you that each histone was an octamer. An octamer is something which has four, four parts to it. So this is an octameric histone core, which has, uh, sorry, eight parts. I said four, I meant eight parts. And what it has is one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. So four plus four, you have eight parts. There are not eight distinct molecules. There are four distinct molecules present as dimers. So you have two molecules of H2A, two molecules of H2B, two molecule, molecules of H3, and two molecules of H4. So eight individual parts, but four total unique parts to it. Four parts which are dimeric. So you have four subtypes, four subtypes, sorry, H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. So if you notice, there's H2, there's H3, there's H4. Where is H1? So H1 is important in keeping the, the DNA tightly linked to the uh, histone. I could not find any good diagrams for this, but uh, <clears throat> you can imagine H1 as a long chain. It's kind of like a bar which keeps your DNA stuck to the nucleosome. It's involved in unwrapping and winding. We'll talk about that later. Okay. And each histone can have post-translational modifications. So post-translation modifications is what basically Hazrat was talking about. Hazrat methylation. So you have methylation, acetylation, ubiquitination, sumoylation, phosphorylation. There are these many kinds of post-translational modifications on the histone tails, which can change whether the DNA is actively expressed or not. How this happens is a completely another subject. And basically, all of this comes down to the availability of DNA. How available is the DNA? The DNA here, if you notice, the DNA is quite available. The linker DNA is long. This part can be actively expressed. But if, say, the distance between these two are small, then this part would not be able to express. That's, that's basically it. If the distance is larger, it can express. If the distance is lesser, it cannot express. Great. So you have this one histone molecule. Around this, you have a 147 nucleotide pair DNA double helix. 
So this whole one and three quarters of a turn is 147 nucleotides, more or less 147 nucleotides. And the width of each nucleosome is around 11 nanometers. So this is just to tell you about the scale of the things we're talking about. Nanometers, these are 10 raised to minus nine meters. A billion, a billion of these molecules would be 11 meters long, not much. Then you have DNA packaging, histone modifications. So if you notice, these are your, this is a space filling model, I think. This is this, I think it's called a space filling model. I'm not quite uh, sure right now. And you have the different octameric forms uh, in the histone. And you have tails. So these are tails which stick out. Tails which stick out of the nucleosome. And these tails are where you have modifications. So a lot of modification act actually occur on H3 tails. So, um, you don't have to remember this, but I'll just tell you right now. In the H3 tails at the lysine 4, the fourth residue of lysine on an H3 tail, if you methylate that, that will activate gene expression. If you have, if you have methylation at the ninth lysine of the H3 tail, you will have a restriction of, uh, restriction of transcription. So the methylation at, uh, at K4, Lysine is K. K is the single uh, single letter amino acid code for lysine. The K, lysine 4. At the fourth position, methylation can activate. At the ninth position, methylation can deactivate. So methylation itself has two different functions and depending on where it occurs. Sorry, does anyone have a question? I'm hearing some voice. Can DNA wrapped around histones be expressed? No, DNA wrapped around histones cannot be expressed. If you want to express that DNA, it has to be unwrapped or the histone has to be moved. Methylation, methyl group is attached to DNA. Yes, this also happens. So uh, methylation of DNA occurs on CPG islands. CPG islands. So it's basically capital C, a small p and a capital G which is basically a C, which is uh, connected to a G, a dinucleotide of C and G. So that's a CPG. And a CPG island is a place where you have a lot of CPG molecules together. Uh, yeah, methylation can occur both on DNA and histones. Methylation on DNA, methylation on DNA is only possible uh, when you have uh, on on cystine, a cytosine molecule, sorry, not cysteine, cytosine, C molecule. And that almost always will deactivate expression. That's a very stable epigenetic mark, which, which is telling you, if you methylate the CPG island, that, that gene is not going to be expressed. Great. Does anyone have any other questions? That's great, I'm glad I could help you. Um, so for example, methylation. So a trimethylation, so you can have three molecules of methyls attached, that will lead to trans uh, promotes transcription and a dimethylation, two methyl groups. And that completely depends on which residue the methylation is occurring on. And it also depends on what proteins are available to, to affect the epigenetic chain. So there's a lot, a lot of, complexity that goes behind epigenetics. Okay, can you all see my screen or is it just one person's problem? Great. Okay, I think, yeah, so I think it's just a problem with his system. Yeah, try rejoining. Sometimes, sometimes Discord is stupid. Great, so I'll continue right now. DNA packaging. So what are DNA histone interactions? So I'll just go back one slide. I will not tell you the answer right now. Does anyone know what would the charge on a histone molecule be? Okay, so we'll do, we'll do another question first. How does the number of methyl groups relate to the place where it binds to in the H3 tail? It does not depend. You can have trimethylation, dimethylations, and monomethylations anywhere. And each, 
each methyl, so methylation is very context dependent. A trimethylation somewhere might activate, a trimethylation some, some other place might deactivate. And this depends on what proteins can bind to that place. So on a, on a fourth residue methylation, you have activating proteins binding. On a ninth residue methylation, you will have uh, deactivating proteins binding. Yep, it's a positive charge on histones. Can you tell me why is it a positive charge? Histones are basic, okay. To interact with DNA, yes. So histones need to be positively charged to have a nice, strong, stable interaction. So that's what you see. So what happens is the minor groove of the DNA is what interacts with the histone the most. So DNA grooves are being utilized. The minor grooves are attached to the histone because it allows more surface area of contact. So a major groove would allow only this surface and this surface to attach. So you have a lot more area which can attach to the histone. And you see GC is preferred. So a GC residue, a GC dinucleotide is preferred on the minor grooves on the outside, but on the minor grooves on the inside, you will have AT residue preference, AT or AA or TT on the minor groove which is inside. Does anyone know why this could happen? Why would AT, AA or TT residues be preferred inside and GC residues be preferred outside? Stability residues are AA, TT and TA dinucleotides. Uh, well, residues might be the wrong term, I'm sorry. Um, I just mean dinucleotides. Number of bonds, yes. Paris, you've seen the discussion earlier, so I think you should not answer. <laughs> yes, the number of bonds is somehow affecting why AA, TT or TA is inside and why GC is outside. So what happens is you have, uh, so there's a very complicated equation. This is a Poisson-Boltzmann equation. This equation, so we'll not get into what each of this can mean, what this equation does. It basically measures your electrostatic interactions which can occur. And based on this equation, they found that AA, TT, and TA dinucleotides are, are more negatively charged than the GC dinucleotides. Now, why this happens, there's a whole, you can write the whole research paper on this. I think there is a, even a research paper on this already published. So what happens is you, you have uh, the narrow minor grooves which are formed by AA, TT, and TA dinucleotides have an enhanced negative electrostatic potential. So this enhanced electrostatic negative potential favors the interaction with arginine residues, arginine residues in proteins. So these proteins can be anything. Right now, this protein is a histone. So are more electrostatically negative than GC segment. So that's why you want more negative charge inside. That's why you have AA, TT, or AT on the inside. Yeah, CG for methylation. Well, epigenetics does not play a role here. This was more about your electrostatic interaction. So that's how DNA coding for life was involved. You have two bonds and three bonds and the AT bonds. So they hypothesize that the two bonds between AT make it more flexible than a GC triple bond. This allows a higher surface area of contact with the proteins. So I'll, I'll be stopping for questions here. Name of the equation, this is a Poisson-Boltzmann equation. Well, let me see if I can copy and, copy and paste. It's P-O-I, oh, wait, I'll just type it up. Yep, I've just posted the name on the chat. I hope my stream did not stop. Is my stream still on? Great. 
so many guesses. Okay, fine. Guess you all are very excited. Yep, yep, the Poisson Boltzmann equation. You all can do this later. This is all chemistry and uh, illegal things. We don't discuss chemistry here. Anyway, DNA packaging, further histone modification. So, you have histone residues. I told you about H2A, H2B, and H. Chemistry is illegal. Um, you have H2A, H2B, H3, and H4 residues. So you have these four kinds of uh, uh, monomers which can form your octamer. You have alternate histone monomers which can be found. So these are alternate monomers. Let's not go into the details of that. Again, that's epigenetics. So you can replace earlier residues with newer residues based on ATP dependent chromatin remodeling complexes. So chromatin remodeling complexes or reduce the distance between histone residues. Oh, sorry, not residues, uh, nucleosomes, basically. They can change the histone present in the nucleosome or reduce the distance between nucleosomes. Here they have not shown the distance part, but they show you can either uh, change a part of the nucleosome histone, you can change one of a few residue, a few monomers at a time, or you can just remove the histone when you want the DNA free for transcription. This can happen. This is a completely free naked DNA. This can undergo transcription at a very high rate. And then you have, again, with the usage of ATP, with the uh, histone chaperones. A chaperone is basically any protein molecule which assists another molecule. So cha chaperones here are just assisting in the, in the movement of these uh, histone molecules. And either you can have a part replacement or a whole histone replaced from a yellow to an orange. Here you remove the yellow and put in an orange. So you can have part of full replacement. And then you have nucleosome condensing. If you remember, I talked about 30 nanometer fibers. I'll go back. Yeah, these 30 nanometers, uh, nanometer fibers and how it's wrapped, uh, the beads on a string is wrapped around itself. We'll be discussing how that happens. So DNA is wrapped around the histone and then these nucleosomes, so you have these nucleosomes on, this is the bead on a string model. And then you, ha you can have it wrapping around itself to form the 30 nanometer fiber in this, in this configuration. You can follow the numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's talk about DNA packaging. So this is genetic inheritance, epigenetic inheritance. Epigenetic inheritance is talking about DNA packaging. Genetic inheritance, we talk about sequence changes. These sequence changes can occur due to mutations, deletions, insertion, anything. A change in the genetic code is a genetic inheritance. So you have a yellow gene and somehow you made a small change around the middle of the yellow gene to have red, a red gene. Therefore, this gene has now turned off. This mutation turned the gene off. And now when you have, uh, when you have mitotic uh, splitting, when your cell splits from the daughter cell, the daughter cells will get a turned off version of the gene. And when they form germ cells, say if, happen, if it happens in the germ line, your progeny will all have the gene X turned off. A, mute, uh, a, a genetic change due to mutation is permanent, but an epigenetic change is not permanent. We'll see how. So say in the parent, you have the gene Y on. We're talking about gene Y now. If you have some sort of a chromatin change, this can occur due to disease, this can occur due to certain drugs, certain foods you're taking, this can occur due to smoke, this can occur due to many, many environmental factors. Environmental, like, environmental factors definitely have an effect on how your epigenetics, uh, epigenetic machinery behaves. So there are a lot of studies on this. Basically, uh, uh, some of you might have uh, heard of the Overcalix cohort studies. Some of you might have heard of the studies which were done during the Dutch winter famine. So Dutch winter famine was during the World War II and Germany had cut off. The Nazis had cut off the supply lines uh, into some parts of Netherlands. And a lot of people starved there. So they're starving. Uh, so I think they had a ration of around 500 or 300 to 500 calories per adult per day. The recommended amount is 2000 calories. 
but they were getting only 300 to 500 per day. So that's a quite a huge difference. And then they saw definite changes in their grandchildren. So somehow putting the grandparents uh, on a very uh, abnormal kind of a situation, such as a famine, had an effect on the offspring two generations ahead in the grandchildren. So that's how epigenetic change can be heritable. And if you can treat it well, somehow it can also be reversed. But during the production of germ cells, so this is the primordial germ cell production, what happens here is, there's an, is a genome-wide epigenetic reprogramming. So reprogramming basically means all, all epigenetic marks are removed. So these are epigenetic marks. This is telling you the gene is off. But during germ cell production, everything is removed. So the germ cell and the, therefore the progeny will have a proper copy of the gene Y. It's a, it's a temporary change. This was a temporary turning off of the gene, which can be turned on again. So that's why epigenetic inheritance is very powerful. And most cancers, in fact, a lot of cancers are dependent upon epigenetic changes. So I'll be taking questions. DNA, bound DNA can't be transcribed. Yep, when it's transcribed, it's unwound. So tightly wound DNA will have much less. So I'm not saying it's absolutely zero when it's wound, but it's much lesser than it would be when it was free. Cancers are dependent upon epigenetic changes. So not transfers, it's changes in epigenetics. And epigenetic changes because these are very easy to... Epigenetic machinery is very easily changed. And it can be turned on or turned off. And why it happens? I don't know why it happens. Because there can be hundreds of reasons for the onset of cancer. Like I, I think I've mentioned this before. Cancer is basically 5,000 diseases in one huge trench coat. You can't form very broad parallels among cancers, but a lot of new cancer research. Uh, in the past two decades, I think, epigenetic research has ramped up. And in the past two decades, you have a lot of, a, a lot of clinical trials on drugs which can alter epigenetic changes. So, so say if the gene Y was a, was a tumor suppressor gene. So you have tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes. So if gene Y was a tumor suppressor gene, uh, tumor suppressor gene, sorry, somehow, somehow something happened to the genome and, and the gene Y got turned off. The tumor suppressor got turned off. Now, what if you could give a drug to reverse this change? The tumor suppressor would be turned on again. If the tumor suppressor is turned on, the tumor can be eliminated in a better manner. So there have been studies done where epigenetic drugs are given to the patients first. And once the epigenetic course is done, then they move on to traditional chemotherapy. And the traditional chemotherapy, the results they get then are much better. But then again, I can, I can give you many, many studies on this, but uh, you cannot draw broad conclusions between cancers or between different patients as well. Every cancer is a different disease. So basically that. Broad generalization, most cancers can somehow be treated by changing the epigenetic machinery. So what other questions are there? Epigen epigenetics regulates genetics. What regulates genetics? Epigenetics, sorry. It's, uh, think of it like the yin and yang symbol. So epigenetics regulates genetics. Genetics can regulate epigenetics. There can be so many factors why epigenetics can be changed. Sexual reproduction is genetic inheritance could be, uh, sexual reproduction is genetic as well as epigenetic inheritance. The sperms you form, the egg cells you form in females, they have some epigenetic marks from the parent. So how you live right now can affect your offspring and their offspring as well, more than just genetic changes. Yep, it's very complicated. Epigenetics is a very new field compared to genetics.
what physically occurs during chromatin change. So what change are you talking about? The distance between nucleosomes or the removal of uh, nucleosomes? Oh, that's great. <laughs> can you completely remove a histone? Yes, you can. Here, the histone is completely removed to give you a completely naked DNA. Histones, no, nucleosomes are histones with wrapped DNA. So this whole thing is a nucleosome. This is the histone, this is the DNA. This whole structure is called a nucleosome. How can you completely remove a histone? So they have chromatin remodeling complexes. So how they work is again, very complicated topic. Basically they are ATP dependent and once they get ATP, they can dissociate histone, the octomer of histones and remove them from the, the specific portion of the genome. There is almost a complete uh, wipeout of epigenetic marks, but there are some factors, so they don't know what. It has been observed in mice, it has been observed in plants, that even though somehow there are some epigenetic marks that stay back. So there can be, there is a complete removal, but there is some other molecule. Think of it, they, scientists think it's an RNA molecule. So some RNA, miRNA, siRNA, lnCRNA, there are different kinds of RNAs. So some some RNA molecules stay back in the germ cell, which can change the epigenetics of the progeny. So it's not the genetic. So imagine, imagine that uh, you are giving your laptop to someone else, and you wipe your hard drive, but you keep a backup of the hard drive on a separate external drive. So technically, the hard drive on the laptop is completely wiped. There are there's nothing, no data on the hard drive. But that external drive has some sort, some data left. And so that external drive is basically what I'm talking about as uh, RNA molecules. Yes, miRNAs and siRNAs. Not miRNAs. miRNAs are more involved in your transcriptional silencing. siRNAs. siRNAs are very interesting. siRNAs, pi RNAs. A uh, lot of epigenetic work they do. I'll be talking about this in the epigenetics course whenever that happens. So if you all want that, depends on the real world situation, stuff like the coronavirus, etc, etc. Anyway, we'll move on. Yes, epigenetics course. Anyway, DNA chromatin. There are two types of chromatin. You have euchromatin and heterochromatin. So what is euchromatin? What is heterochromatin? Euchromatin is basically open chromatin. I told you, uh, remember about the distance between the nucleosomes. In a euchromatin, the distance between nucleosomes is greater, so the DNA is more open. In a heterochromatin, it's close. The distance between nucleosomes is very less. So what happens here is the, the, there's a repression of uh, transcription. Here, there's an act activation of transcription because the DNA is more free. And you can see the protein molecules can come, your RNA polymerases, transcriptional factors can come and bind to the free DNA to start transcribing. But here, they have issue accessing the DNA. Deacetylated histone tail. So acetylation is an active mark. Deacetylation means the histone is inactive, the nucleosome is inactive. Methylation of CPG, I think Chunky Ham asked about this. Methylation of CPG is an inactive mark. 